Um, I'm Mahmoud Adrazik, as uh, Zada have uh, introduced us already, and I'm going to talk to you about databases. So, um, these are the uh, topics that we're going to discuss today. And first, the question is, what is a database and why do we need it? As Zada already explained a bit about it, databases exist to serve the purpose of storing information and making it available later on for analysis, for querying, investigation, and so on. And in modern life, I am sure that everyone who is in here in this workshop have used some sort of database before. Maybe they knew that they're using the database as a primary user, or maybe they didn't because it just serves under layers of obfuscation in a website. The purpose of a database in archaeology in, or in our project is rather collect information in order for this information to be available for researchers later on for querying the, the information and understanding more about the sites and maybe providing doing some sort of analysis. Um, and some forms of data collection that exist to serve this database are common things like field reports. So you start from the site, you collect the data in written format. And then if you maybe have some more digital tools, you can also measure some, do some measurements or collect the data in the digital form to begin with. But later on um, in a computer lab, you might want to add this data into a database. Now, the question here is in terms of data collection, what kind of formats are a database? So is a field report a database? Is a Word document a database? They might be, but then what features do we know about database that we want to ask about these particular types of formats? Well, we know that databases should enable us to collect information directly using standardized types of questions. And this doesn't exist in either types unless we organize them in a way that has some tables, maybe some dictionaries, some standardized formats that we can just ask a standardized question to and get the information that we need. Okay, so maybe a table is a database. Tables are one of the simplest forms that we can use to do standardized queries to and get information that we expect and need using these standardized questions. What kind of questions we might ask? We might want to ask, what is the cultural period of a site? And given that we know the name of the site, we can just ask this table, what is the cultural period of the site X? And it will always return what exists here. It's I and H. So if we use the exact same question, what is the cultural period for the site Y, we will get Roman. So we know if we just change the variables of the question, we will get the results and this will work across all the sites that exist in this database. What's different from a Word document or a field report is that in these examples, things might be written in a free text format that differs between different people. So someone might say that of the site cultural period is so and so, and someone might say, based on the evidence that we can see in this site, it is so and so. And yes, a human is able to read these two texts and understand exactly what is meant by them, but a computer will not be able to do that easily. So in order for this to happen fast, and in a quick way on inside the computer, we need to provide it with a standardized format similar to the one that we can see here. Okay, so we know that we can ask about the cultural period, but what kind of questions we can ask for this table? Can we compare the ages of these sites in terms of do we know just by looking at this table, which one is older? Well, if you already have a prior knowledge of what is Roman and what is Iron Age and at which time periods they existed, then you might be able to conduct this sort of calculation inside your head and identify which is older. 
but the database will not be able to provide you with this. This particular table will not be able to provide you with that. You cannot subtract Iron Age from Roman and find the difference. And you cannot do the other way. You cannot do subtraction, you cannot do additions. Okay, so how can we imply this? How can we make it possible for a database to provide us with this kind of answers? We do that with different data types. So, as you've already seen, the string data type is just text. What do we use it for? We use it for descriptions, maybe names, items that cannot be quantified in such a way that it can be inputted as other types of data. So as you've already seen, the name of the site is a text, is a string type. The cultural period that we have used is also a string. You might think uh, now about different types of strings, or, you know, different types of information that can be stored as string. The good thing about strings is that we can use some certain types of queries. For example, we can do searches, similar to what you would do in any search engine as Google, Bing, or whatever you prefer. What you would do is you type some text and then run this search through the database and it will return all the matches that it will find. So you will know that this particular text existed in this particular location within the database. What you cannot do is you cannot subtract, divide, add text to each other. You can contact text, so you can bring two pieces of text together, but it will not be as meaningful as arithmetics. So you cannot add iron age to Roman and get a different age. We do this by using the numeric type. Numeric types are just numbers. What they mean is a representation of certain features of the site that we describe. So we can see here that the feature count within this site is two. We know that there are two features in this site that we are recording. The good thing about numeric type is that we can do arithmetics on it. So we can add, multiply, subtract, can do any sort of mathematical um, processes that can be done on numbers. And this can be very useful for us if we want, say, to count all the features that exist in all the sites that we have surveyed. So we can run a query that collects the numbers, feature counts, of each of the sites and then add them all together. And now we know how many features exist in the database. This would not have been possible if the information was recorded in a string type, because all what we have got is just two, 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 maybe how many numbers has been recorded. And then we will have to do this kind of calculation ourselves. But if we use the numeric type, then we can do that automatically within the database. What numeric type does not provide us with is the ability to understand the time. The problem here is that if you say right now here in the UK is 845. So what is the difference between 845 in the morning and 845 in the evening is zero. But we know that's not true maybe use 24 hours, but then what would happen if you subtract 845 of yesterday from today? It will be zero as well. So how do we solve this problem? We use date and time format. In databases, there are specific types specialized to deal with the date and time. An example here is an activity that was conducted in the site was done on the 1st of January of the year 2000. And the good thing about this is that we can use it to understand differences in age, which is very, very important for archaeology. Another type of data information that we can record is Boolean. Do we know something happened or didn't? Does this particular site or feature that we describe in satisfy certain sit descriptors that we have before or not? Has the site been excavated or not? 
did we find information about certain object or we didn't? This is very useful because we might want to run surveys later on. We can want, we might want to say, okay, we want to know all the sites that we have already visited and all the sites that we haven't visited yet. Maybe we're doing a later on survey and we want to understand which sites exist in a certain location, and which sites exist in a different location. And speaking of location, neither of these data types actually explains the location in such a way that will enable us to do queries based on the location. And what kind of queries this might be? For example, do we know that a certain point, a certain sites exist in a country? We cannot do that with either of these types unless we specify this information with, within the database, written in the database beforehand. But if we want to run this kind of calculation, we'll need a very special type of data, which is location. Now, I'm not going to talk about location because this is what Junaid will do, but I will give you an example. This is the example, or rather an extended example of what Azad have already presented. And you can see here quite a few types that we talked about. So for example, we have the name, in a string type, all of these are strings. And then we have here numeric type, and we have Boolean, and we also have date. Now, one thing you will notice is that most of this table is stored in string types. So it's quite predominant. We use it pretty much everywhere. But other types also provide us with some information, with some types of queries that we wouldn't have been able to run on the string type. Now, one thing you might notice as well is the information of location is stored in a numeric form. But then again, that doesn't provide us with all the types of queries that we might need to run on the location data, which again is something that Junaid will speak about. One thing you'll notice as well is that the information is stored in rather different uh, tables. So you have the site name and the function in its own table, and then you have the name again, and the activity and the date in another table. And then yet the name again here, describing who recorded the site. Why do we do this? We do this as a step of data modeling. So we started from the data that was collected in the field or even before going into the field, we understand what kind of data we want to collect. And we divide these data into different sets that will be stored in its own templates. These sets are named entities. So what is an entity? An entity is a, a thing, a place, person, unit, whatever you want to describe in your database, but it has to be one thing. You cannot use the same table to describe a country and its capital. You cannot use the same table to describe a larger entity and smaller entities within them, or two entities that are completely different. Why? Because each of the tables will contain attributes. So here, for example, we're talking about the collection or the recording of the site. What do we need to know? What we need to know is the name of the site that was recorded, the rule of the person or the group who have recorded the site and the organization that they work for. We're not talking in this table about the function of the site. It's recorded in a different table. Okay, so how do we know that this site, site X, has a certain function? We know that using relationships. Relationships here are links between the two sites, between the two tables, sorry. And we use them to be able to know how can to be to, to be able to extend the queries from one table to the other table so if we know for example that this particular site 
was recorded by this group, and we know that this particular site X has this function, then we might be able to ask who have recorded information about domestic sites. And this can be done by understanding first what sites has domestic function, and then carrying the query to this table and looking at the organization and the roles using what we already know from this table. This can be done through relationships. Okay, so what type of relationships exist? We have one to one, one to many, and many to many. These represent all the different types of relationships within what is called relational database. Now you might think that relational database comes from relationships, but that's not correct. It actually comes from the kind of mathematics that lie underneath this particular type of database. So what is one-to-one -one relationship might be like? It is what exists between a country and its capital. Each country has one capital, and the capital can be a capital for only one country. What can be an example for one too many? One site can have many artifacts within it, but a certain artifact cannot exist in multiple sites in the same time. That means it's a different artifact. It might be the same type, but it wouldn't be the same exact one. It would be a different object. Many to many might be sites that were mapped by different entities, by different organizations. So one organization can map multiple sites, but also one site can be mapped by multiple organizations. And we use all these different types of relationships, the three types, with the tables in order to have a construction of database that will be usable for our purposes. So you might want to use one-to-one -one between two tables and one-to-many between other tables just for the purpose of encoding within the database this kind of information, the differences that we've just explained. So if you know that a certain object, if we know that a certain object only has a relationship with one object, then we use one-to-one. -one. If we know that one object have relationship with multiple objects, then we use one-to-many. And if we know that multiple objects within our table has relationships with multiple objects within another table, then we use many-to-many. And the way that we do the connection between the tables is using keys. So within the site, within the sites table here, we can use the name as some sort of identifier if we want to know what's the difference between the site X and site Y, we need to refer to site X somehow. So we refer to it so far using the name. But then names are not unique all the time. There are multiple sites that host the same name and multiple people, multiple organizations might call the same site with different names. So what we need is a certain identifier, something unique that will not be repeated with any of the sites. And the way that we do that is we use in primary keys. So for each row of this table, we have one primary key. This key is unique. It's not repeated anywhere else in the table. So we now know that if we refer to site S1, that this will always return site X. And if we refer to site S2, we will always return site Y. How this is useful for us outside the boundaries of the table is by using this primary key as a foreign key in another table. So we know here that the function domestic has the primary key of F1. And we know that site X has a function of being domestic. 
So we use the primary key of site X in association with the primary key of the function in its own table here to convey this relationship. So once we see that S1 exists here as a foreign key, we can immediately understand that the function domestic relates to site X. And we can see this using the key. How to see that in the example that we've just looked at is similar is here. So you can see that the site name and the site ID has their own table. So we use this as a starting point. And we do all, the, all sorts of connections with this table to other tables that describe multiple different attributes. So site X has the primary key of S1. And we can see here that S1 exists as a foreign key. So we can already understand that this object, which is described in multiple attributes, exist within site X. Same thing for the second feature here, or second object. And then if we go to the third one, we can see that the foreign key is S2, which refers to site Y. Okay, so this is one too many. So within one site exist multiple objects or features. But what happens if we want to describe multiple organizations that can survive multiple sites, we have to use many to many. And then the problem arises is that we cannot add the primary keys of each of the tables to the other in such a way that will enable us to convey this relationship. So what we will do is we build our own small table that is just specified for the foreign keys to interact with each other. And we use this as a bridge between the two tables to jump back and forth and understand which entity have mapped which site. Because as we can see here already, the site one, site S1, have been mapped by this entity, by the Department of Antiquities. And we can see that the site S2 have been mapped by both the Department of Antiquities and the University of Cambridge. Now, we can have other sites that were mapped by both of them, again, similar to site S2. And we have multiple sites that were mapped by each of these organizations. So this is many to many relationship. Now let's take a closer look at this relationship. We can already see that we have to split the information into multiple tables. And then we have to create tables just to explain this kind of relationship, which might not be ideal. Okay. So are there any type of data, any other types of data that we can use data structures that will convey this sort of information? Well, so far we have been speaking about relation, relational databases, which in database jargon is referred to mostly as SQL, SQL, Structured Query Language which is the language that is used to build these queries and to interrogate this database, to collect information out of it, even to create it. But there are other types of databases that does not rely on SQL. And these types of, these types of databases can be used to convey the same information in a different way. Of course, it has its own advantages and disadvantages similar to what we have with SQL here. So here is an example. And I appreciate it looks very convoluted, but this is a sample of what is called a JSON object. 
JSON is an abbreviation that is not really related to databases, so we're not going to talk about it. But what we will see here is that this example is divided into keys and values. And it has a structure. So the key is the site ID and the value is S1. And then another key of the site name with a value site X. So if we run a certain type of query on this JSON object and we ask it, what is the site name of the site ID of the site that has the site ID S1, it will be able to return this information here. It will be able to return site X directly from this kind of from this query. And we can run the exact same query here. So we can ask, what is the site name of the site that has the ID S2? And it will return site Y. So this part is consistent. We already have seen similar things in the structured or relational databases. What's slightly different is within the same object, we can already see information about the recorder, which previously required its own table. So you can see here that we have a key named recorder, and then the value for this key is rather a description of this recorder. And inside S1 here, you can already see that's just one recorder, but inside S2, there are multiple recorders. And this can be expressed directly within the structure. So you don't really need a different file or an additional structure to express this. One downside that you might have already noticed is that the information about the recorder is repeated. So this will add to the data size and it might not be ideal for the use of the data, but a good item or a good advantage of this type of uh, recording the information of this data structure is that you don't really need to go outside the bounds of the object to understand all the information about it. So within the same object, you can already understand that we have multiple recorders and these are the attributes of these recorders. The first one is from the Department of Antiquities and the second one is from the University of Cambridge. So, we can see that there is a different type of data structure, different from tables to record information. Are there different databases that use either of these types? Well, yes, there are. So you might be able to recognize some logos or names of these database types or paradigms and some of them might be new to you. This slide here is for reference, so you can use it later just to check on these different types and understand exactly what each of these types represent. But I just wanted to note here that relational databases, the tables that we've been already speaking about for the most of this presentation, they are represented by these engines here. So these are database softwares that you can use to store your database, to query the information from the database, and eventually to do your analysis if you want. The JSON object that we just seen in the previous slide can be seen mostly here in the document database. In fact, a simpler version of it can be seen in both the key value type and in the white column type. Key value rather is just a simple dictionary. So we have seen in the previous slide here that this is a key and a value. So if we just cut this bit here, this is maybe a simplest form to express what is a key value database is. And you might think that this is really too simple. Why anyone would use this? Well, there is a purpose for it. And the purpose for it comes from this all the di diverse types of databases that exist 
and the reasons for each of them to exist. Because in database design, there is always three main variables that you look at. The cost or the resources, the time that will take you to build the database and query the information from, and the use requirements for this database to exist. And most of the time, it's very, very difficult to balance all three together. So some of these databases try as much as possible to lean towards one of these requirements for special types of use cases. In Arches, which we're going to talk about in the second session, we predominantly rely on this one, Postgres, and Elasticsearch. There are other optional types of databases to use as well with Arches, but they're not as important as these two. And as you already can tell, because this is a relational database, this will contain tables. And this one here, Elasticsearch, is rather a search engine. And the value of using it is because using this search engine allows us to search through text very, very fast, much faster than what would happen if we used relational database all over. OK. So we have so many different types of databases, and we don't really fully understand all of them, but we want to know which one are we going to use and why? Which one is better? And for this, again, we're going to have to look at the variables that we use. So what kind of data will we request? Do we know exactly the queries that we will ask for every single time? And an example of that is, for example, is um, if you know that this particular researcher will always need the site names and maybe the site cultural period, then you can store the information in such a way that will make it easier to collect these two types of information only and nothing else. But if we're using some sort of query that has to jump between tables to collect information, then this might be a different type of database to use is a very general wide rule. If we want to collect information across tables, then use, using the JSON objects or the document type of database might not be advisable. It's not as flexible as using the relational databases. So the first question we want to answer is what kind of data we will use later on, what kind of queries we will run later on. So we start from the end here, we start looking at the researchers who will use the database and we want to understand what information they will need, what kind of calculation they will need to perform in order for them to collect this data from the database. And based on this, we can start designing our database. We can look at different types of database engines, and we can specify which one will be more suitable for this particular use case. And the second question is, how much resources do we have? Do we have a limited amount of storage and processing power? Most likely not, because this comes with a limited funding, and no one has a limited funding. So we need to find a type of database that requires only the amount of, of uh, processing power and storage that we have. Again, as a very general wide rule, a good planned and designed database usually will need more size if it's document or JSON and less size if it's relational database. This doesn't apply everywhere, it's just an estimation. For the processing power, usually relational databases require more power. And the reason for this is because you need to perform this kind of hops jumping between the tables. 
And these kind of queries require processing power much more than you would need for the JSON objects. And then the third question is time. So how much time between sending the query and receiving the answer? Are our researchers happy with waiting for a day for the data to be collected and sent back to them? They might be. And sometimes databases are such large entities that people would actually need to wait for such long time. But sometimes it might not be possible. Sometimes we would need the information to be returned immediately within a few milliseconds. So this also adds to our choices. Some databases are faster than others. So we need to use a database that would allow us to collect the information we need, would be within the limit of resources we have, and would provide us our answers within a reasonable amount of time. Sadly, this perfect database doesn't exist. There will always be compromises. So can we try to use multiple databases together? And the answer is yes. I've already mentioned in the previous slide that within Arches, we're using Postgres and Elasticsearch. Each of them serves its own purpose. So you can, if you want, use multiple types of databases together. And hopefully using later sessions not just today, but maybe later on as well, we'll be able to reach more answers about the questions that we face here, about the data structures, the uses of the databases, and how can we best use them to serve the purpose of querying the information that you will need about each of the sites. With this, I will end my presentation and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Mahmoud, for this um, very informative and great presentation. Thank you. Um, so I would like to now open it to the floor to ask your questions. You can raise your hand, um, ask the questions, or you can write in the chat box. And as um, Stefania said, in, in the format of today's workshop, we it's, it's less interactive. We talk, give presentation, and give time for questions. But you can, anytime, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box when the presenter speaks as well. Um, but now let's see if, if there are any questions. Please, um, you can raise your hand, because I don't think there are any questions already in the chat. Um, yes, there is a question from um, Jibril. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. This is Jibril. Hello, everybody. Right. Are you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. I'm sorry for my uh, bad English. Um, Senegal is in the University of South of Dakar. I have done my PhD in France, Perpignan University, and they have a database. In this database, many sites are storage, and we have many specialists. And when I arrived, I had to make my database, but it's only to put all information on Excel and have uh, one monitoring. He put all the information and put them on the database. After they give us a K, K word, if I need to put uh, into another information, I have only just to, to put the uh, K word and I enter in the database. 
was that a right and uh, separated of uh, speciality? You have a GTEC uh, database, formal database, human uh, data database, and all sites also are separated because they have working on a lot of, lot of sites. And my question is when I am here in Senegal, it is possible to use the database and who managing this work if I have to change, edit, or delete some information? I don't know if you understand my question. For example, when I am here in Senegal, I need to use the database for my site to some site somewhere if it's possible and who is responsible you can contact okay um if i understand your question correctly you're asking about the ability of using the database in different countries other than the uk as presumably the database will be hosted did i understand the question correctly yes international yeah perfect yes so this depends on the, in the type of the database. We can go much more in details in terms of the structure of the sort of technology that we can use, or we use it rather. Uh, but Arches, and we're going to talk about that in the second session, provides you with an interface that you can use to query the information from. So in the second session, there will be much more information about exactly the question that you're asking now. Just as a tangent from it, almost all sorts of databases that I have already talked about here, and you can go much deeper in details in each of these particular engines or softwares, can be hosted locally. So if your needs meets any of these particular databases, it is possible to implement an instance, a database instance locally and host the information on it in order for, say, you or other researchers to be able to query the information. Now, this might not go hand in hand with Arches, but again, we <coughs> need much more information in order to be able to assess the situation and to understand exactly what is the best use case for here. Just again, as a general rule for Arches, there is an interface you can query the information from. It's reliant on web app. so. It should be possible to access it just using a browser. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Sorry, I wanted to add to this, Jibril. Uh, I hear you are working in Sudan, in Senegal. Where? I... Are you are you based in Senegal? No, since I'm in, in Senegal, but I yes. had, no. Uh... I just wanted to add that within the scope of the project. Mm -hmm. the Mayazam in particular, where we are also operating in Senegal, the idea is that the databases will be stored nationally. So mm -hmm. obviously the data belongs to the custodians of the data and they are stored nationally. So we will have to set up a system so that the data are stored nationally. The opportunity is then obviously to create a super database that aggregates uh, data for all the countries in Africa that we are working with so that this will be stored for the moment in Cambridge because we have a powerful server and will give an opportunity to you and to your colleagues to do searches across data that go beyond the boundary of your own country. So for example, in the case of Mali and Senegal, you could do a searches on the tumuli, for example, that go across the boundaries of the present day countries and that you may be interested in. So there is this dual system, the data can be stored locally. And then for the purpose of the project, it will be stored in Cambridge specifically this time um, and shared across all the countries that are participating in the project. Um, because obviously it is acknowledged that the data belong to the custodians of the data that are in the country. Thank you very much, I understand. Thank you, Jibril. <clears throat> Anything now, Aftab has a question. 
If you can unmute yourself, Aftab, and you can ask your question. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mahmoud. Uh, I do you have any idea for the deterioration and three years of sites? Do you have any idea? And uh, do you have any workflow for the working of the, uh, the deterioration of and, and threats of the site in South Asian archaeology? Because of uh, last three years, uh, we are working in South uh, in uh, in India. Approximately 50% site has been uh, uh, site is destroying. Uh, by uh, by the landowner and and site owner because it, uh, it is major problem for the south south asian archaeology so if you have any ideas and if you have any uh, data for working please tell us um i'm sorry i'm not going to be able to answer this question i i should have mentioned in the beginning my background is not archaeology so I wouldn't be able to answer this particular question. I feel like it relates more to other archaeology. I feel like maybe um, someone from the massive project will better, be better suited to answer uh, than me. Yeah, if, if I may, um, thank you for the question. And, and you raised the important point about the destruction of the archaeological sites. Um, and this is one of the concerns uh, of the MASA project is to document sites which are under threat. Um, and as part of our work through, workflow, we will be working um, to identify sites which are either threatened or have previously have been destroyed. And so we will be using a variety of techniques, in particular using satellite imagery and remote sensing um, to identify um, potential sites or sites which um, perhaps have been destroyed but are detectable through remote sensing methods, but also using ground truthing um, and, and most importantly, working closely with our um, partners and collaborators in South Asia um, to, to, to work on the ground um, with field work and, gr and ground truthing to identify sites. So you raise a very important point um, about these sites and uh, that, that's certainly part of the MASA project aim um, is, to, is to document these sites which are under threat and, and which are disappearing. So thank you. Um, thanks, Aftab. And, and, and following on that and going with the databases, there is a, um, we're going to add the capability in the database in order to be able to record the threats and um, um, the condition of sites. So in order to have the assessment of the condition in the database as well, so it can help with the decision makings and um, use of the database. Um, are there... Yes. Can, can I suggest a, uh, a small thing uh, for the Mahmoud? Because Mahmoud is working very well. Uh, I, uh, I, I heard because of, uh, he has a good uh, strategy for the uh, sites. And I think uh, uh, he used an open data kit. Open data kit is very good for the analysis of data, I think. Uh, and uh, try to uh, create a workflow uh, for, uh, for, for the heritage and, uh, uh, and architecture site. I think we should try also uh, for the working on uh, for the open data kit for the using uh, uh, using for exploration and excavation. And uh, also, uh, I I know uh, the Cam uh, Cameron Factory is working uh, in exploration excavation. Uh, uh, he excavated many sites in uh, Haryana and surrounding area. So also, uh, I worked with Adam Green and use open data kit. Uh, for the ex uh, for the exploration, uh, we have good results for the Turin's uh, project. So I think we should try to use an open data kit for the analysis of the data and try to create as a workflow and then use for the exploration. Well, thank you very much for the suggestion. Yes, we, we are uh, aware of the open data kit and we have explored it. Um, we're looking into exactly what can, uh, what advantages we can uh, use it for and of course it has some limitations as well so um, as again explained in the presentation each tool has its own advantages and disadvantages and we have to use some sort of like a combination of tools so this will be maybe not talked about as much in the following presentations but arches has its own data tool like data collection tools called arches collector um, again some limitations some advantages 
So yes, Open Data Kit is a wonderful tool. It's open source. Uh, you can modify the code yourself, and you can even add some additions to it. And uh, but one issue is that uh, it has no official support with uh, iOS. So uh, it's something. Yeah, it's 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 something. So you you might want something that is available across board. So just yeah, Open Data Kit is a great uh, tool. We might use it depend on the situation. Thank you for the suggestion. Yes, and we're going to have follow up and um, other um, training and workshops on different aspects. And one is um, exactly the um, open data kit or Arches tool. However, we decide that it's going to be used for, especially for the field when um, you record data coming from the field in order then to upload it into the database. But we, we will have, we will cover um, most of the things. But thanks, thanks for um, your note that your. Um, advantages or, or, or you're, that you're happy with Open Data Kit so we can have more discussions about that. 